there are basically three key uh, events in our life of faith. Three major uh, events. First is the incarnation, so Christmas time, Advent. Uh, this is God becoming man, Jesus coming into the world. And that, that, that in itself is simply amazing. What, what, what a miracle. What, what wisdom from, from, from God in doing it that way to bring salvation to all of us. No one, no one expected it. And uh, it simply was uh, so very amazing, so stupendous, the incarnation. Secondly, would be the crucifixion and the resurrection. And Jesus, of course, going to the cross in order to win for us our salvation. And that's the culmination of his public ministry and the very mission why the Father sent him into the world. Then the third is Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit to fill God's people in order to enable them to continue with the divine work of Jesus and specifically the work of mission. So we just celebrated Pentecost last uh, Sunday and Pentecost is so very crucial to the life and mission of our church. And so we as Catholics, as a Catholic especially, must know what Pentecost means. Because as we will see, and as you probably know, in our own lives before our entering more deeply into the renewal, and then in the life of uh, many others that we are aware of, much has not been lived out you know, uh, about the fullness of Pentecost. And much is even not truly known by Catholics today. So if this is uh, so very important in the life and mission of uh, the church, in our life of faith, we simply need to know. And so we, we start with ourselves in MFC, and let's take a closer look at the of Pentecost. And basic is Pentecost is all about empowerment to be the witnesses of Jesus. We read in the Luke 24, verses 48 to 49, Jesus telling the disciples before he ascended into heaven, he said, You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Now, that's very interesting because the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, uh, the Great Commission before Jesus ascended into heaven, what he said was, go. I'm done with my work now. It's your turn. I'm going to go up to heaven. But you, you go. Proclaim the gospel to all of creation, make disciples of all the nations. But here in the gospel of you, he basically says, wait, there's still something more. Apart from everything that I've done for you, I, I taught you, I sent you on practicum, I answered your questions, I manifested my power before you, uh, I explained my parables. So aside from all of these things, there is one more thing that needs to happen so that you truly would be empowered for mission. And that is the promise of my Father, and that is the Holy Spirit. So you remain in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then we read in Acts 1, verse 8, it says there, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the descent of the Holy Spirit, is all about empowerment in order to be witnesses to Jesus and witnesses of Jesus, in order to be able to do mission. So that, that's a key uh, aspect, uh, meaning of uh, Pentecost. Now, this empowerment comes through what we would call 
uh, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is simply the infilling of the Holy Spirit into the lives of, of people. And Acts 2 verse 4 says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And what is the aim of all of this? Why does God pour out his spirit upon his people? Well, the ultimate aim, the aim is salvation. That is the very reason Jesus came into the world. That is the very reason Jesus went to the cross and died for us. And that is the very reason why Jesus sent his Holy Spirit. We read in Acts 2, verses 17 and 21, where uh, Peter quoted from the prophet Joel, and Joel said, It will come to pass in the last days, God says, that I will pour out a portion of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And it shall be that everyone shall be saved who calls on the name of the Lord. So this is the crucial aspect. What ultimately is Pentecost all about? About salvation. What is the reason why the Father sent Jesus into the world? It is about salvation. And that's the, in effect, the, the be all and the end all. Now, the fullness of the work of salvation is a work of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is often depicted, depicted as fire. And indeed, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came as tongues as of fire. In Acts 2 verse 3, we read, then there appeared to them tongues as of fire, which parted and came to rest on each one of them. And what happens, what happened on the day of uh, Pentecost, again, the work of the triune God. So God, first of all, creating, once again, his people, recreating his people. So first of all, God created Adam and Eve. Our first parents, and that's the start of the uh, human race. And then, much later on, God created his own people. He chose a people, Hebrew slaves in Egypt, entered into covenant with them, and recreated them as his own people. I will be your God, you will be my people. You know? And then, now, starting with the Pentecost, he establishes, he creates the church, the new people of God. And fire is so much a part of, 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 of this. We, we read in Exodus 19, verse 18, when God entered into covenant with his chosen people, it says there, now Mount Sinai was completely enveloped in smoke. Because the Lord had come down upon it in fire. The smoke rose from it as though from a kiln. And the whole mountain trembled violently. So that was the presence of God at Mount Sinai entering into covenant with his uh, people. Now, what has happened with the apostles, God has entered into a new covenant. And again, he is recreating his people, the new people of God, you know, coming out from uh, Judaism, you know, but those who would now follow his son, Jesus. And we know that at the end of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people uh, accepted the, the gospel message you know, and were incorporated into what would now be uh, the church. So the work of God uh, in recreating his church. And then there is Jesus who, of course, is the Redeemer. And he is the one who won salvation uh, for the world. And one thing that he said, as he had gone on his uh, public ministry, uh, he said in Luke 12, verse 49, 
I have come to set the earth on fire. And how I wish it will already blazing. So again, it is God, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, you know, saying that he came to set the earth on fire. And that would be the fire, of course, of his love and the fire of his uh, Holy Spirit. And so we have the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, whose task is to empower God's recreated people, the church, for mission. The very reason why God established his church, and that is to do mission. And we see that is what actually happened from the 3,000 that joined uh, the people of God on the day of Pentecost. Uh, what, what happens because the uh, people were doing uh, evangelization, It says in Acts 2, verse 47, And every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. They were doing rapid and massive evangelization. So that each and every day people were being saved. So all of this imagery of, of fire is very important. And one thing that we know that fire does is to purify. That's why... Uh, gold or silver is uh, purified by fire. And the prophet Malachi had this to say in Malachi 3 verse 19, For the day is coming, blazing like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble, and the day that is coming will set them on fire, leaving them neither root nor branch says the Lord of hosts. The fire is to purify. The fire is to burn away you know, all the impurities, the sins of the, the people, so that there will be a people, a church that is pure and able to do the very mission entrusted to, to, to her. So we look at Pentecost, and what we need to see is such a very crucial event in the life of the church and in the work of uh, the, the people of God. And again, unfortunately, most Catholics simply are not aware of the fullness of what Pentecost is all about. And if you're not aware, then such Catholics can end up thwarting the work of the triune God. So we want to understand more. We want to enter more deeply into this whole uh, aspect of uh, Pentecost. And Pentecost, again, is about the life and mission of the people of God. And it entails various calls. And uh, uh, we, we need to know uh, because... Uh, for many Catholics, these various calls or callings are not being lived out. And it simply cannot be that way. You know? Such an important event, such a crucial aspect of the life of faith. People need to understand so that they can apply themselves and live out these callings. So five different callings, but in interrelated. You know? And basically... Uh, this is about the life and mission of the church. So first, it is a call to mission. And what is that mission? It is to preach the gospel uh, throughout the whole world. It's to preach repentance. And Jesus says to the disciples before he ascended to heaven in Luke 24, verse 47, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all the nations. So that's the Great Commission according to, to, to Luke. It's a call to mission for the people of God. That is what the people of God need to do. It's to preach repentance so that people will turn away from their sins and turn to faith in Jesus. Secondly, it is a call to 
holiness. Because the call to mission, it is divine work. And for one to be able to do divine work, one must try to be holy. One must be a holy uh, instrument. And that's why we see the importance of fire because fire purifies. It burns away all the impurities. We read in Matthew, Ma Malachi 3, verses uh, 2 to 4. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand firm when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire, like fuller's lie. He will sit refining and purifying silver, and he will purify the Levites, refining them like gold or silver, that they may bring offerings to the Lord in righteousness, then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will please the Lord. The fire needs to purify us of, of, of sin so that we will live righteous lives. And when we come before the Lord in prayer, in worship, uh, then it, uh, we will be uh, pleasing to uh, the Lord, our, our, our God. So we read in Matthew 3 verse 11, John tells the disciples, he was baptizing and the disciple, uh, people were coming, and John tells uh, the, the people about Jesus, and he says, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So the difference between the baptism of John, which was a baptism of repentance to cleanse away sin, and the baptism of uh, Jesus, which is... Uh, uh, baptism with the Holy Spirit, baptism by fire. So, it's a call to holiness, to be purified, to be a fitting vessel. So, thirdly, the third call is a call to empowerment for mission. Because we're doing the very mission of God, and it's such an important mission, it's all about salvation of people, then we need to be empowered and uh, uh, that's why, again, in the Gospel of Luke, before Jesus ascended into heaven, Luke 24, verse 49, he says, And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So aside from everything that Jesus had done for them, he he prepared them, he taught them, but now they needed power that is beyond themselves. And that is the empowerment that comes from uh, God's very own Holy uh, Spirit to be able to do mission. The fourth call, in doing this mission, we are called to zeal and boldness for mission. And again, you know, uh, fire is a fitting imagery because we say uh, in secular terminology, you are fired up. That means you are zealous, you are gung-ho, you are uh, really raring to go and do whatever is necessary in order to accomplish uh, the task at, at hand. And this is what actually Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 16. He said, if I preach the gospel, this is no reason for me to boast, for an obligation has been imposed on me. And woe to me if I do not preach it. You know that the sending of the people of God to proclaim the gospel, that is a command. It's not an option. And, and Paul recognize, recognizes that. An obligation has been imposed on me. And he says, woe to me. If I have the sin of omission, if I don't do what God commands, if I don't make myself, allow myself to be used as an instrument for this very important work of proclaiming God's salvation to others, woe to me. Especially if much has been given. Especially if, if you no, know, like us in MFC, God has blessed us so much, has taught us so much, and we know so much about the life and mission of, of the church. And if we don't proclaim the gospel, if we don't participate in that work, woe to us, we will be held 
accountable. Okay. The fifth call is a call to community to be able to do mission because it's not just an individual call. There has to be community. There has to be uh, the, the, the church. And we know that uh, part of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, is the giving by the Holy Spirit of gifts. And the Spirit gives gifts to everyone in the Christian community. But what everyone now is supposed to do is to put all of those gifts together as one community, as one body of Christ, and use all of those gifts in order to effectively do mission. So it's not just the gift of individuals by themselves. Okay, they, they, they can do something, but to become much more effective as church, they need to come together and make use of those, those gifts. And so on this day of Pentecost, the church is established. We read in Acts 2, verse, verse 41 to 42. Those who accepted this message, Peter's message, were baptized. And about 3,000 persons were added that day. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. In other words, they were a community. They were a people of God. And what needed to happen to build up the, the community was now happening, including the work of massive evangelization. So. Five inter intertwining calls. That's what Pentecost is about. Now, Pentecost is more particularly about the sending of the Holy Spirit. And so again, we have the very important role of the Holy Spirit. Of course, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons in uh, one triune God. Uh, all are very important, but each one has... Uh, his uh, specific uh, role and here when we talk of empowerment for mission uh, we look to the role of the, the Holy Spirit you know? so this empowerment for mission is made possible by specific, specific aspects in the work of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit touches us touches different parts of our uh, body and, of course, our whole being in order to prepare us, to prep us for the work that is at hand. So eight things that, that uh, we, we, we will look at how the Holy Spirit uh, touches us. First of all, the Holy Spirit touches our eyes. Now, first, before that, touches our mouth. And the Holy Spirit enables us to acknowledge Jesus as Lord by the word of our mouth, by our proclamation. We acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. We read in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3, Paul says, therefore, I tell you that nobody speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. So it's the Spirit of God that enables us to be able to proclaim Jesus as Lord. That prevents us from uh, cursing uh, Jesus or saying that he is accursed. We are prevented from saying the wrong things, the erroneous things. But we do say simply what is right, what is uh, true. Now, if we acknowledge Jesus as Lord, then we are to submit uh, to him. We are to follow him. We are to obey him as master. In fact, one question that uh, questionally question may confront us when we stray away and don't obey what we know to be Jesus' commands, is Jesus asking us in Luke 6, verse 46, Why do you call me, Lord, Lord, but not do what I command? 
If you acknowledge Jesus as Lord, then you do what he says. Otherwise, it's just empty words. Otherwise, it's hypocrisy. Or otherwise, it is disobedient or rebellion. You know that Jesus is Lord, but you don't do it. So it, it, it cannot be. We simply have to obey. And of course, as we saw in our previous theme, that is how we build uh, on a uh, rock. We, we read in uh, Luke 6, verses 47 to 49, I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, listens to my words, and acts on them. So how do we build on rock? How do we build a foundation that is on rock? We listen to the words of Jesus, our Lord, our Master, and we act on them. And Jesus says that when you build on a uh, foundation of rock, then your house will not be shaken when the river bursts. Not like the house without the foundation, which will be uh, swept away. So this is our stability in, in faith. This is our steadfastness. This is what helps us to, to endure, to, to persevere through the challenges, the floods, the winds that try to bring us, us down. Then if we say that Jesus is Lord, so the Holy Spirit uh, touches our mouths and enables us to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, then what it should mean is that we imitate Jesus. So Jesus is our model. Even, even Paul, as he imitates Jesus, he says in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I assure you, I am imitating Christ. Paul is saying, you don't see Christ. I talk to you about, uh, to, to you about him, uh, what he teaches, but you don't see him. You don't see his facial expression. You don't see his body language. You don't hear his tone of voice. But me, you see so imitate me as I imitate Christ. And of course, Jesus did many things, many righteous things. And among the things that he did, where he told us to imitate him, was when he washed the feet of his disciples. In John 13, verses 13 to 15, he told them, You call me teacher and master. And rightly so, for indeed I am. If I, therefore, the, te the master and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. I have given you a model to follow, so that as I have done for you, you should also do. Now see that that was a very difficult thing that Jesus was telling them to do. Because washing the feet was the task of the lowest slave. And, and his disciples, at, at one point, they were thinking about uh, who is the greatest among us. Uh, Jesus, can we sit at the, your right and your left? You know? And they experienced actually power uh, already. They were in the privileged company of the Messiah. You know? So to wash somebody's feet, to do uh, the work of the lowest slave, it would have been very difficult. And so the way that Jesus imparted us was to do it himself. He literally lowered himself. He needed to kneel down in order to wash the feet of the disciples. And then he said, well, this is what I did for you. I am the Lord and Master. You know it. You say it. And rightly so. But if I wash your feet, that's what you should also do. I have given you an example, a model that you are to follow. And then if we do look on Jesus as our Lord. Then we entrust our whole life to him. Actually, that's a wonderful thing. Sometimes some Christians are apprehensive. If I entrust my whole life to Jesus, I wonder what he will make me do. Maybe he'll make me give up things. Maybe uh, he will dampen my ambition for success. Uh, maybe he will uh, give me uh, discipline and suffering to purify me. 
maybe he'll send me off to martyrdom. So, so some people are, can be afraid. But why should that be? Here is the Savior, the Lord, who gave his very life for us, even when we were sinners, who assures us all the time, I have a wonderful plan for you, a future full of hope. I will always be there for you. You can put your faith in me. In me. You can trust me for everything. When you call, I will answer. God assures us of all of this, and this is God. It's not just some powerful person or a beloved uh, relative or friend. This is God himself giving us all of these assurances. And when we entrust our whole life to Jesus, we've done the best for ourselves. Don't act for your own life. Because we can make a mess of our life. And oftentimes we decide things that we don't know are not really good for us. But God knows what is good, what is best for us. You entrust your life to Jesus and you are assured of your eternal well-being. So the Holy Spirit touches our mouths to enable us to proclaim Jesus as Lord. Secondly, the Holy Spirit touches our eyes and causes us to see truth, the truth of the good news clearly. This is what uh, we, we, we read about uh, Jesus sending his Holy Spirit in, in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 8 to 11. Jesus, and when he comes, he will convict the world in regard to sin and righteousness and condemnation. Sin, because they do not believe in me. Righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will no longer see me. Condemnation, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. What does that mean? What are we supposed to, to see about uh, the, the, the good news that Jesus came to bring and that we are to proclaim to, to many others? Well, the, the three things that uh, Jesus uh, uh, outlines here. First of all, that basic sin is refusal, refusal to believe in Jesus. And, and uh, we are called to put our faith in Jesus. That's the best thing that we can do. But if we refuse to put our faith in him, to believe in him, to turn away from sin and turn to our a new life in him, then that is sin. Then our sin remains. Then we remain in sin. And we are not experiencing the salvation of Jesus. And then he says, righteousness, because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me. Well, what, what does that mean? Well, even though Jesus was condemned as a criminal, it is righteousness that has ultimately triumphed because Jesus is now with the Father. He was not, he was condemned by the world as a criminal, but he did not suffer the condemnation of such criminality because he is uh, rewarded by being with the Father in heaven. And then the third thing that Jesus says, it says uh, condemnation, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. It is not Jesus actually who was condemned, but it is Satan who has been condemned through Jesus' death and resurrection. The head of the serpent was crushed on Calvary and Jesus won the victory. Okay. The third aspect that the Holy Spirit touches is our heart. And the Holy Spirit teaches us to pray. Prayer 
is of the heart. I mean, oftentimes it's of the mind. You know, we're, we're thinking, what are the words that I'm going to say? But prayer ought to be of the heart. It is communing with God. And, and it is the spirit within us that touches the spirit of God, of the, of, of the heart. So the, the Holy Spirit helps us to uh, pray and would even uh, inter intercede for us. This is what we read in Romans 8 verses uh, 26 to 27. In the same way, the Spirit too comes to the aid of our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit itself intercedes with inexpressible groanings. And the one who searches hearts knows what is the intention of the Spirit because it intercedes for the Holy Ones according to God's will. Now, this is a very profound uh, passage. Very important as well. First of all, Paul says that the Holy Spirit comes to the aid, to our aid in our uh, weakness when it comes to prayer. We do not know how to pray as we ought. And that, that is true. Again, uh, many people just pray for what they like, what they think will make them happy. And oftentimes this would mean uh, material things and material pleasures. But we don't realize that oftentimes material things and material pleasures are what takes us away from God. So imagine coming into the presence of God and then praying for something that will take us away from Him. It's as if we are praying, Lord, uh, uh, help me uh, to enjoy this sin. <laughs> I really enjoy it. <laughs> That would be ridiculous. But then Paul says, well, uh, we do not know how to pray. We ought to pray. And so here is where the Holy Spirit can come in because the Spirit intercedes on our behalf with inexpressible groanings. What, what, is, what are those inexpressible groanings? That means praying in tongues. And you know that tongues is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and uh, when the Holy Spirit came down upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost, they all spoke in tongues. And later on in the book of Acts, whenever they prayed with people for the outpouring of infilling of the Holy Spirit, they usually spoke in tongues. So tongues was a natural uh, experience for the early Christians. Unfortunately, we don't have that anymore today. And... Uh, uh, except for charismatic renewal. In fact, uh, on uh, Pentecost, when the reading is in 1 Corinthians 12, which is about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and I wrote an, an article from the Servant General article on it, it skips the verses, 1 Corinthians 12, I think uh, 7, that actually enumerates the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. So it just says, yeah, there are gifts and the Spirit uh, distributes gifts to each one, but it um, and, and that, that we become one body. But it actually skips. It is not read. On the day of Pentecost, the spiritual gifts are not read. And the spiritual gifts are very, very important, very crucial to empower. Well, each one is given a gift. Now you put all of those gifts together to empower the church to do mission. And I, I don't know why uh, those gifts are not enumerated. It doesn't take long. It's not a long passage to, to, to read. Maybe because there are many people in the church that think that's passe. That is what happened with the early church, but we don't have that anymore now. But no, all the more especially in the call to the new evangelization, old evangelization, but recreated and expressed in a new way. So the, 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 the scripts that came, that were given by the Holy Spirit to the early church, these are the very gifts that we need today. Maybe some pastors, so, because they have not experienced 
many of the, the, the nine gifts that are enumerated there, expression of wisdom, expression of knowledge, uh, faith, healing, miracles, uh, prophecy, discernment of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. Many, perhaps many pastors do not know about them. Many pastors have experienced them. Many pastors will not be able to, to explain what, what these gifts are. So the church just skips it. That is, to me, that is uh, truly un un unfortunate. Okay, but but we're, we're back to this uh, passage in Romans 8, where the Spirit intercedes with inexpressible groanings. And then, what does it say? The one who searches hearts knows what is the intention of the Spirit because it intercedes for the holy ones according to God's will. When we pray in tongues, and we, we don't understand, our mind does not understand, that's the, the nature of tongues, but we are praying uh, according to the Holy Spirit, which would always be in accordance with God's will. Unlike, unlike what I was saying earlier, when, when we pray as we, we pray as we ought, because we are asking for things that are not good for us, but that will never happen when it is the Holy Spirit praying in and through us. It will always be according to God's will. And, 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 and that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. That becomes a perfect prayer. Nothing at all wrong with the prayer. Nothing contrary to the ways of God, to the will of God. Simply in sync, in line with everything that Jesus taught and what uh, the authentic angel teachings of our church uh, are. It's a perfect prayer. Now, I, I just always tell people when, when I uh, speak about this, it can be dangerous. Now, I'll put that in quotations, dangerous. Because you, again, do not know what the Holy Spirit is interceding for you to God for. So you be ready to receive what you pray for. Like maybe, maybe not many of us will pray, Lord, I want to be your martyr. I really want to, to, to live my life for you. But that might be what the Holy Spirit is praying for you. Because one of the greatest things that can happen to a Christian is to offer his life for Christ. That was the privilege of, of uh, all the apostles except John and many other Christians uh, who preceded us, the saints of all. The Holy Spirit might be praying, uh, Lord, please take away this uh, material blessings that I have because it, it stands in the way of my growing in holiness. Uh, Lord, please uh, give me much more uh, suffering and pain uh, so that I can appreciate a little bit of, of uh, your cross and what you actually did for me. Uh -huh. And knowing that such suffering and pain can, can purify me, can discipline me, can set me on the right track. Okay. So, but you know, it is a perfect prayer. And that's where we always rest assured. God only wants what is great for us. And that is what happens there. So the Holy Spirit touches our hearts and helps us to pray as we ought. The fourth thing, the Holy Spirit touches our minds in that the Holy Spirit teaches us so when, when we are taught, when you, when you hear teachings, when you go to a formation program, it's your mind that is working. You, you listen with your ears, but your mind is absorbing it. You know? And hopefully at some point from the mind, it goes down to the, to the heart and you internalize and you, you live it out. Uh, the Holy Spirit touches our mind as the Holy Spirit uh, teaches us. Jesus says in John 14, verse 26, the Advocate, the Holy Spirit that the Father will send in my name, he will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. It's a very important rule. 
of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, as we have also been told by Jesus, guides us to all truth. We, we see in John 16, verses 13 to 14, when he comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you to all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will speak what he hears and will declare to you the things that are coming. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit takes what is God's, what is Christ, and that's what is declared to us, what is taught to us, how uh, the Holy Spirit guides us, and we are guided to truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And truth is so very crucial, especially during these times, because our opponent, the devil, is the father of lies, the total opposite, as light and darkness, as, as uh, 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 truth and, and falsehood, total uh, opposites that are, that are there. It's very crucial, especially today, because of the modernism that is in the world and has come into the church. Many Catholics today are confused because their own pastors are speaking untruths. For example, there are many Catholics today that accept and do not reject the culture of death, divorce, euthanasia, abortion, total population control, and homosexual relationships. They accept this. They celebrate it. Abortion is health care. Abortion is the right of every uh, woman. Homosexual relationships are are okay as long as the two uh, love each other. And so many are confused. What is it? And then uh, today, currently in, in, in the church, big, uh, I wouldn't say debate, but uh, two points of view among the pastors uh, in the church where the Vatican says, uh, you cannot bless same-sex unions because same-sex unions are sinful and the church cannot bless sin. So what do hundreds of uh, priests in the Western world, in Europe, in Austria, in other places, what do they do? They go and bless same-sex unions. They actually call same-sex couples in order to bless them in blatant uh, rejection, in rebellious rejection against the truth that the, uh, the Vatican has, has uh, uh, given out. What's happening? And aren't these things obvious? Isn't it obvious that homosexual relationships are wrong, are intrinsically evil? How can some clerics and, and condoned by bishops actually bless same-sex unions? And then even for those who are pro-abortion or have actually undergone abortions and have not repented of this, you know, some pastors gave Holy Communion to them. And so those who see that, Catholics are confused. Is it wrong? Is abortion wrong or is it okay? Is uh, active homosexuality wrong or is it okay? Look, the pastors are giving communion to these people. It must be okay. That's truly unfortunate. Where is the Holy Spirit in all of this? Well, it's not the Holy Spirit's fault. It's uh, the fault of people who uh, don't open the, up their minds and hearts to the Holy Spirit, to the spirit of, of truth. Many are also confused today as to what really is the work of evangelization. Because Catholics are being told by some in the church that they should not proselytize. That means to say they should not make converts. But isn't that what evangelization is all about? Isn't that what the Great Commission is all about? Where Jesus himself says, go and make disciples of all the nations. 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that conversion? Isn't that moving someone who is not uh, a Catholic to become a Catholic Christian? But we're being told, don't do that. Other religions are fine. So this, this, these are all untruths. These are all lies. And, and we need so much uh, the Holy Spirit to touch our minds and to teach us and to guide us to all truth. Thing. The Holy Spirit touches our hand as he takes our hand to guide us as children of God. You know how little children, when you're walking along, uh, usually you would take their hand uh, to, to, to keep the child from, from tripping and falling or to keep the child from uh, just uh, going off, uh, veering, veering away. Maybe just to assure the, the, the child that, okay, here I am, uh, the, the, the parent, and I'm here for you. Don't worry, I'm taking care of you. But the Holy Spirit touches our hands to guide us as children of, of God. We're told in Romans 8 verse 14, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. If we allow the Holy Spirit to take our hand and lead us, we are being led to God and we are being led uh, to truly be the children of, of God. Now, when that happens, then we need never anything because we are holding on to the Holy Spirit. And that's why in the next verse, in verse 15, it says there, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you receive a spirit of adoption through which we cry, Abba, Father. God is our Father. And we are brought into His presence. And because of that, we need never fear. We're totally secure in the embrace of our, of our Father. There is no longer the slip, spirit of slavery. We are no longer enslaved to, to uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil. We have been freed. And we have been uh, more intimately into the presence of uh, the Father. In fact, we, as children of God, are heirs. In, in, in the next verses, verses 16 to 17. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Jesus is our brother. Jesus is the Son of God. And so we too are children of God. And Jesus, the, uh, the Father and the Son, Jesus is the, the heir of, 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 of two. We too are, are heirs. And what a wonderful thing uh, that is. What we truly can look forward to, everything that is of God, the fullness of blessings that are there. We are heir to, to all of that. But of course, that also means, because it oftentimes is a good thing, suffering. We are also heirs to suffering. Jesus' the son suffered. That was what God uh, allowed to happen in his life. And in our lives also as Christians, as followers of Christ, as children of God, we also will uh, suffer. So still in verse 17, it says there, If only we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Now this is important. Suffering and glory go together. Suffering, of course, is oftentimes uh, looked on negatively. People don't like it. It's always looked on positively. We like it. But the two come together. And so whenever God allows us to suffer, it will be for a good purpose. And that is ultimately that we, as his heirs, as the children of God, 
will experience the fullness of glory that comes along with that. And that's why Paul is able to say in the next verse, verse 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are as nothing compared with the glory to be revealed for us. And that's important for us, brothers and sisters. If ever you are undergoing suffering and, and pain, don't be so just focused on the suffering. I mean, that's, of course, easier said than done. But don't just focus on that. But try to look on the glory, on what this result in for me, how I will become a better Christian, how I will be nearer and more intimate uh, to, to, to Jesus, my Lord, my Savior, how God continues to be at work in me, forming me, burning me, drawing me ever closer uh, to him and to his ways. So, you know, if, if suffering is necessary for all of that, just as Jesus suffered in order to win salvation for all, then let it be. But look to the glory that is to come. And that is, that is what will help you uh, uh, along. Okay, the sixth thing. The Holy Spirit touches our inner defense mechanism. I like to think of in terms of uh, uh, the, the pandemic team, there, there is uh, uh, an inner, uh, uh, a built-in uh, defense mechanism you know, that ought to fight whenever there are intrusions of uh, infections or of uh, viruses. So, uh, Holy Spirit uh, ignites or touches our inner defense mechanism. And the Holy Spirit does this by helping us to oppose the flesh that is within us. So, a virus comes in, the, the uh, inner defense mechanism fights that, that virus. So, in the same way, uh, the flesh is also within us, but the Holy Spirit opposes the flesh that is within us. Here's what we read in Galatians 5, verses 16 to 21. Paul says, I say then, live by the Spirit, and you will certainly not gratify the desire of the flesh. For the flesh has desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are opposed to each other so that you may not do what you want. But if you are guided by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious. Immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, rivalry, jealousy, outbursts of fury, acts of selfishness, dissensions, factions, occasions of envy, drinking bouts, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So, very by uh, Paul telling people that, that uh, the, the flesh and the spirit are, are opposed. But if you are led by the spirit, then uh, you can overcome the works of the flesh. And he lists all of those uh, works of the flesh. And he says, if you uh, do such things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Our goal is to enter into the kingdom of God, to enter into eternal life. But then there is the flesh within us that tries to bring us down, that tries to prevent that. And so Paul teaches us, this is uh, what the Spirit does for you, the Spirit that opposes the flesh. But you, know, you, you need to do your part, you need to cooperate with, with the Spirit. Because the, the flesh within is very powerful. We, we talk of uh, the world of flesh and the devil, the three powerful negative influences uh, in, in our life as, as Christians. So the flesh is very powerful and the flesh needs to be countered. But just on our own, we are weak. We might not be able to do that. And so we need the spirit that is within us to counter the flesh that is there. 
when when Paul here talks about the the flesh, uh, he, he lists uh, eighteen works of the flesh, uh, fifteen works of the flesh, and they are about purity and unity. Now that on nicely to the internal and to the external purity our own body and then unity uh, the body of christ of which we are a a, a part now what what the uh, for this there are seven uh works of the flesh that have to do with impurity Immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, uh, drinking bouts, and orgy. And then there are eight that have to do with re relationships within the body, which cause disunity uh, and great difficulty within the body. And what are those? Hate, rivalry, jealousy, outbursts of fury. Acts of selfishness, dissensions, factions, occasions of envy. These things happen in Christian community. And, and uh, the more that a particular body of people are being used, the more that the devil will, will try to attack and try to, to stir up uh, these things and cause these things to, to happen. And so we need to, to resist and, and we need to uh, uh, allow the spirit that is poured out into our hearts to fight, to oppose the, the works of the flesh that are there. Otherwise, we cannot effectively do mission and we cannot even inherit the, the kingdom. Paul uh, says uh, later on in Galatians 5 verse 25, again, talking of the uh, inner and outer, verse 25, he says, if we live in the spirit, let us also follow the spirit. How? Again, the inner disposition and the outer uh, posture uh, with, with, with the body of, of Christ. So uh, the inner in verse 24. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with his passions and desires. And then the outer, the, 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 the body of which we are a part in verse 26, let us not be conceited, provoking one another, envious of one another. These are the things that cause strife and cause disunity. And so we truly need to oppose the flesh within us, the works of the flesh, so that we personally will be pure and that uh, the body of which we are a part will be united for mission. The seventh thing, it touches, the Holy Spirit touches our very being. As the Holy Spirit imparts the fruit of the Spirit. So the fruit of the Spirit uh, that uh, is given forth in, in, in us, as we live according not to the works of the flesh, but according to the ways of the Spirit. And Paul enumerates this uh, fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, verse 22 to 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Wonderful things, as you can really see. But uh, we, we struggle with many of those. The very first thing, love. Uh, the most basic virtue for a Christian is love. The two greatest commandments about love, love of God and love of uh, neighbor. But oftentimes we fail to love. And we might not even understand that love is uh, the very love of Christ. It's, not, it's not, certainly not human love. It's not the love that is in the world which is oftentimes sinful, but it is the love of Christ. It is unilateral, unconditional, self-sacrificial. And so it is with all the other things that are there. Joy, for example, you know, that even in suffering, even in pain, even in our grief, there can, there should be always joy. 
Because our joy is in the Lord. If the Lord is always there for us, we're with, with uh, Christ, we uh, have a good assurance that we will make it to heaven, then that is cause for joy. Whatever else is happening in our life. So all the other things. Now I point out one more thing. Uh, Paul says here, the fruit of the Spirit. He does not say the fruits of the Spirit. So the work of the Holy Spirit is supposed to result in one fruit that has uh, uh, this this nine in this particular listing nine different dimensions so it's not enough to say okay i'm growing in love in joy in peace but you know i'm just impatient and i can't get out of that uh, and i have no self-control no then you you do not have the fullness of the holy spirit uh, with you we need to uh, work at to strive to consciously strive uh, by virtue by the virtue of god and the uh, strength of the holy spirit to uh, develop to allow the fruit of the holy spirit to be developed in us one fruit with all of these different aspects in other words, when you look at all of these things, it's really about perfection. It's really about holiness unto the Father. We, we oftentimes uh, think when we hear Jesus' uh, command, so be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect. How can that be? God is perfect. I'm not perfect. And that indeed that is true. We will not be perfect unless until we are uh, fully uh, cleansed and uh, uh, purified in purgatory before we enter uh, into 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 heaven you know? uh, but here we see the practical aspects of it we can understand love joy peace patience kindness generosity faithfulness gentleness self-control we know that these are things that we are able to do if only we are docile to the holy spirit and the Holy Spirit, of course, wants to work all of these things in us so that we can become perfect in Christ. Finally, the eighth thing, the Holy Spirit fuses us. So we've been talking about parts of the, our body, but now takes us and fuses us into the one body of Christ. The Holy Spirit brings us into the body of uh, Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free persons, and we were all given to drink of one spirit. We're one body. We are one church. And on the day of Pentecost, the church was established, and it is the one body of Christ, and Christ cannot be divided. Unfortunately, uh, the, the members of that body today are, are dividing uh, the very one body of Christ, but that is not how it should be. We're baptized into one body and we drink of uh, the one spirit. So we, we look not just at how the Holy Spirit touches us individually, of course that's important, that, that has to happen, but how the Holy Spirit brings us together as a community. The communal work of the Holy Spirit. Bring about one body. And Paul says in verse 12, As a body is one, though it has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many, are one body, so also Christ. Now that's profound. But that's important. If we really see that we are all parts of the one body of Christ, there are ears, there are hands, there are eyes, you know, and all the different parts of the body, again, putting all the gifts given by the Holy Spirit to individuals together so that the church can do uh, an effective work of uh, mission. But if we are all parts of one body, well, what does that mean? You, know, you, you don't try to do uh, anything that will be bad for uh, the body. And, and 
No, I, I, I cannot uh, take uh, uh, illegal drugs, for example, or get drunk and say, well, I, I, I enjoy my, my taste. I enjoy uh, drinking a lot. And when I take uh, least illegal drugs, I'm, I'm on a high. So there are parts of my body that will, but everything else, the rest of the body is deteriorating because all of that. And so we are part of one body. We have to be concerned about uh, all the parts of the body. And if we were that way, then we, we would be able to more easily avoid the works of the flesh that have to do with this unity. We, we don't need to be envious of someone else because uh, that someone else and we are part of the one body. We don't want to fight with uh, fellow uh, Christians for no uh, good reason because that brings uh, strife and discord, which is not good for the body, for peace and unity and good order. So uh, that, that is, that is uh, so very uh, in, in important. You know? And of course, the individual gifts that are put together to do effective uh, mission. And then the reality, the truth that we are in this church, in this body together. And whatever happens, for better or for worse, we are together. In verse 26, Paul says, if one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all the parts share its joy. And that too is very helpful to unity. You don't have to be envious of some other group in the, in the church that is doing great and your own group is not doing great. Because we share in the joy that is there. We are part of that one body. And... Uh, if, if our own group is doing well and there are things that we, we can share with others, we do so. We, we, we don't keep it to ourselves. No, we want to be better. No, we want to keep our secrets, our ways of doing things. No, we, we share because we're all in this together. We suffer together. We uh, are honored together. We rejoice together. And we make it to heaven together. So, brothers and sisters, the importance of Pentecost, the importance of the work of the Holy Spirit, Catholics need to understand. So that, as you, as you can see from what I've talked about, uh, there are many things that we, we do uh, by our own initiative, hopefully prodded by the Holy Spirit. But if we don't know, we don't know where to go, we don't know what to do, we don't know what to ask for, what to pray for, it doesn't work that way. So we need to know more uh, what Pentecost is all about and the work of the Holy Spirit is all about. I leave you one with uh, one final word. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Paul says in Ephesians 4 verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were sealed for the day of redemption. God sends us His Holy Spirit, not just to empower us for mission, but to help assure our own salvation, that we are sealed for the day of redemption. And as we do mission, then we do the same for others. We are used as instruments of God in order to help bring salvation to many others. We grieve the Holy Spirit, not just if we sin, but we grieve the Holy Spirit if we do not open ourselves up to all the works of the Holy Spirit, to all the intent of God, to what I've been talking about here, and then uh, much more that I have not taken up here. We need to understand more and more what the Holy Spirit is about and be docile to the Spirit, submit to the very Spirit of God, and that is what will give us a wonderful life as we are all destined for greatness in Christ to do the very divine work of Jesus and to ultimately make it all together to heaven.